hello, fellow data enthusiasts. Um, prepared a lot for today, uh, but I'd like to start with a bit of a personal experience, right? Um, a common request to data teams um, seems to be to provide insights on data. At least that's my experience. And I always find it a very difficult expectation to live up to because what is considered meaningful usually is in the eye of the beholder. And what it means and what it requires at the very least is a, is a shared understanding of terms and definitions, a shared worldview, so to speak. And it also requires an appreciation of what it means to work with data in the first place. So um, let me switch to, to here. So I always say that data is just stuff and, and data is evidence of events that are frozen in time for us to uncover and analyze if we choose to do so. And I often use this metaphor of paleontologists and biologists examining the fossil record to piece together what happened in the murky depths of prehistory, trying to figure out if this, you know, this bit of, of bone belongs to this bit of, of shoulder and things like that. And these scientists, they have to work with fragmented bits of information at the best of times. And new discoveries may shine a new light on existing assumptions. Luckily, though not always so, we have more data these days describing all kinds of things, but the principle remains the same. So with data, the same base product, the, the raw data or the transactions that we collect in our data solution, it's always, it's infinitely malleable into all kinds of shapes and sizes. And what is considered an insight depends on the way this result can be applied to our context and to what we seek out to achieve in the first place. Or in different word, uh, uh, words, it's a process that may continue <laughs> to require adjustments over a period of time. And that's never really done. Um, but at some point, all involved parties should be in agreement and happy with the result. They also need to fully understand the nuances of, of the, you know, the, the result they're looking at. So today is about insights, a, a, a word I'm not a big fan of, but um, we'll try to make the best of it. My name is Roland Vos. I'm a data specialist. I'm an automation enthusiast, and I've been working in the data area in different roles and looked at it from different perspectives for, for, for many years. I've been a consultant, I've been a trainer, I've been a manager in the corporate world, and I've been a software developer. And throughout this career, the concept of data solution automation, so the ability to forward engineer data solutions, has been a consistent factor. And these days, I'm working at Vergence, the leading software in the data solution automation space. You may have heard of BIML, BI Markup Language, especially if you've been active in the, micro, in the, in the Microsoft world. We develop a product called BIMLflex which allows you to manage your data solution and forward engineer the structures and data logistics processes for a variety of architectures. Last week, I presented the first part of this webinar series, and that session was more about the different solutions you will get by adopting different perspectives on data modeling and to what extent they meet fundamental requirements for a data solution. So that was the conceptual part, and today is going to be more practical. And we'll use BIMLflex to create a business model, specify our target architecture, and then forward engineer the solution and use it to review the data it creates and see if we can find some answers. I'm not saying insights here, I'm just keeping on answers, right? That's one of the set the bar at a realistic level. Even though we will use business modeling as a starting point for our design, you can still develop the solution in many ways. And we, we try to make BIMLflex as flexible as possible to support this. Having a structured way to guide the design process, however, can, can, can really simplify the physical model that it creates. And it, it provides a more abstract design, or it, it gives you a more abstract way to deliver a better fit-for-purpose physical model. And at some point, at the end of the day, you still need to map the data to a model somewhere, right? So basically what we're saying is having a business modeling approach supported in your data solution automation technology makes it easier to map the source data to this more holistic business model and use this to generate the entire solution. And that's what, what we want to do today. Adopting a business model helps to reduce 
this bias that can creep into some of the designs when this design is based too much on how specific operational systems call and do things. At the same time, you're still applying the same mapping and generation concepts. You're still building a data solution, albeit at a slightly more elevated level of abstraction. If you do this, it will be easier to integrate new data sets because they still largely follow the same concept, even though some data sets may use different names for things. But we can use them, we, we can map them to the existing concept much easier. And with Bimelflex, we're trying to, to mimic and, and support this dynamic, this more engaging team activity of workshopping. You know, you're in this room and you've got these post-its and you, you try to describe the, the reality uh, of the things that you're trying to, to model and you discuss terms and definitions and move these post-its around. That's that dynamic workshop experience is what we're trying to support. And we understand that a software tool can never really replace this in-person collaboration. We're trying to make it the best experience it can be. To do this, we collaborated with a lot of uh, you know, a lot of parties that uh, that work in the modeling space to to see how we can do this and to cement a structured approach for data modeling in the tool while also enabling other ways of doing so. So let's get started. Um, this presentation will run for about 45 minutes. I've been already talking for eight of them, but this should be fine. And it leaves us for around 15 minutes of questions, if there are any, at the end of the presentation. Part of this presentation will be a software demo. And we can't really do justice to all the different details and features and options and configurations that you sort of can, can modify to personalize your data solution, but to use the specific conventions and patterns and everything that you may want to use. And I will go through this pretty fast. If you would like to know more about a certain aspect that we so we're racing through today, uh, please reach out to me and then we can organize some time for a more you know, deeper dive session if, uh, if that's of interest. So today I wanted to explain this modeling um, a concept and the way to use it to generate the, the, the data solution with um, a case study. So meet CoverUp. CoverUp is a fictional insurance company. And it will have the center stage today for our modeling efforts. CoverUp is a new and disruptive player in insurance. They focus on, on well, basically the, a, a direct-to-consumer model, right, which uh, can be called a retail model, which means that they don't sell their insurance policy via intermediaries or anything. They just sell them directly to the customers from their website or their portal. And by doing this, they can keep the cost down, still uh, maximize revenue and still focus on the customer service because in these direct to consumer retail models that's uh, you know it's always important but here it's, it's arguably even the utmost important so customer centricity is the keyword here and as a business it's finding out it's finding the the right balance between the products and services and their acceptable risk levels as well as you know, continue to provide the best possible customer experience and value that you can. For a business model such as this, it's important to understand what the customer is doing online. So what products are they looking at? Are there specific drivers that can be recognized when customers purchase an insurance policy? Things like that. So CoverUp would like to know in this example, what, how many quotes lead up to a conversion. So the, the conversion from a quote to a sale. And also what kind of benefits were considered, but ultimately not selected. So you can imagine that a given customer looks at different combination of benefits and what is included in the policy and what's not. Look at different plans and combination and limits and everything. The more is covered, the higher the premium will be. So it's up to the customer to select what cover they really need and what premium they're happy to pay to cover the risk. So customers play around with these different options, and if all goes well, they end up finding or selecting, purchasing the one that, that best fits their purpose. From the insurance side, it's important that 
you're able to follow this process and see where improvements can be made in this, uh, this purchase path. So we'll do this, and we'll do this with Mike. Mike is our customer, and he's in the market for a new insurance policy. So meet Mike. So Mike here has been reading some, uh, some good reviews on CoverUp, and he decides to go online and go to the, the CoverUp portal and consider a policy for him and his family, a wife and, and three kids. The first thing he'll do is to compare the various options that are available. For, and for argument's sake, the, the, the initial quoted the plan, the, the standard plan, the silver plan, seems good. It covers everybody, doesn't have access. So that sounds pretty good. There's also, there are also other plans, for example, the gold plan, which has better cover. But the additional listed benefits, extreme events is one of the benefits, for example, didn't really seem worth the extra money for Mike. The only downside of the silver plan is that he has to fill out a pre-existing condition checklist, but that's okay. Basically a couple of questions when the, the actual purchase takes place. So that's it. That's for his and his personal circumstance. That's acceptable. Still wants to think about it, so he decides to create an account, save the quote, and sleep on it for a day. The next day, though, he logs back in, retrieves the saved quote, modifies it slightly, right? Increase the limits on some of the of the benefits, and then checks everybody's details. Did I did I now did he fill out the age correct for all the kids, and then completes the purchase. There's only you know the, the additional limits, so the modifications of the, the the update of the quote don't really impact the price materially anyway. So you know it seems to be worth the extra one or two dollars or so. So that's what happens. And from a customer's point of view, they're all set. They're good to go. What does this mean for the cover-up insurance company? So what happens in their systems? First off, it's a great sale. The risk profile that is calculated for this policy puts, puts Mike and his family in the, in the good risk uh, bucket, if you like. So insurance companies tend to work with a concept such combined ratio, which means that on average, uh, for example, if this, this is an 80% combined ratio, you've got 80% is reserved for claims and 20%, so 20 cents out of a dollar, can be used to maintain customer service and improve the portal and things like that, focus on the experience. More importantly, every click on the website and change of the quote is recorded in the system. And that's super important because the tracking of these transactions from quote to sale can really provide some interesting information on the pur purchasing behavior, which can then be used to further improve the portal down the line. So, as we, uh, as, so what we can see is that while Mike is looking at different quotes online, these actions are recorded as data points in CoverUp system. Every event, every transaction is recorded with a unique identifier, the event ID. And at this stage, now the first the first day when Mike is is browsing uh, the different options, you don't know anything about the customer. So there is an identifier, the user ID, which you know, should be used to to um, to identify the customer, but we don't really know anything about the customer because he, uh, he or she hasn't made you know, <laughs> him or herself known yet. All we know is that these events were created in a single session. When Mike wants to save his quote, he would have to create an account in order to do so. And at this stage, we know something more about the customer. And because the session is still the same, we are able to, to, to relate these records together and infer that the previous events were also triggered by Mike. When the quote is saved, a customer record is created in the policy management system. And this is the core operational system that is used by CoverUp. The other insured parties, the wife and the kids, they're also created as customers at the same time. So at this stage, the quote is still there. It's not a policy yet but records are created nonetheless. There is, a, there is a, a footprint of what this customer, Mike, has been doing online 
visible in the systems to cover up. So the next day, Mike retrieves the quote and moves to purchase the policy. So he converts from a quote to a sale. And because this is a new session, it is the next day, the session ID will be different, but CoverUp would still know this is Mike we're talking about because he logged in to retrieve his saved quote. And in principle, we also, or CoverUp would also be able to link those two sessions this way, right? So we can, with a bit of effort, put together this, this customer journey, if you like. And at the end of the day, when the sale is done, when the conversion is done, then a policy is created in the policy management system. So from a system perspective, there's three main data sets involved. We have the quote service, which is the event tracking. All the transactions are recorded here. So every click, every action, every modification, everything. We also have the customer master, policy master tables from the policy management system that are you know, more the OLTP or the operational application that, uh, you know, that the employees work with every day. This is the data we can use to find the answer to these initial questions that we uh, that, uh, that CoverUp tries to answer. How many quotes lead to a conversion and what kind of benefits were not selected? To answer these questions, we can create a data solution. And the first step is to agree on the business model. As a very brief recap, because this has been the topic of, of the last session, the process of business modeling is as follows. So first, we just want to capture everything that we have, right? We want to capture all the involved business concepts and put them with the proverbial post-its on the, on, on the walls. So capture everything following the, the, the business process that we know. We need to classify them by their type. Is it a thing? Is it a person? Whatever classifications we're, uh, we're using, whatever um, methodology we use, ELM, sample logic modeling, for example, or industry reference models, doesn't really matter, but we need to classify them, organize them by type. We also need to make sure that we remove any duplicates or synonyms, so decluttering the model. Make sure that any business concepts are not really attributes or properties of other business concepts, so try to, to attribute them. And then make sure we, we capture them all, so add any ones we're missing. Once we've done that, we can then say for each action or each event, which business concepts are related to it, which means that for every event, we've removed the ones we don't need. And that will give you an event matrix that says this action, this, this event, has these business concepts associated with it. That can then be translated to a diagram where we can then add additional relationship for you know, things that may not directly be related to an event, for example, natural relationships. Um, we'll get a couple of good ones in uh, in this example. But that's at a high level, the, the steps you're going through. And for example, assemble logic model modeling, it gives you a really structured way to, to do so. So let's go through that a little bit. So we have a working business model that we can, uh, can attach data to and forward engineer the solution. <clears throat> so in our case, Mike, went online to consider a policy for him and his wife and three kids. The quoted premium, $31 for argument's sake, for the silver plan was good enough, et cetera. So what happens here is that we can pick up these business concepts and put them into their designated category. So we can start mapping things out. We do this for the whole story that I just mentioned, right? This whole case study. And this is a modeling case that we do in, in workshops from time to time. But uh, today we're going to use it for some, you know, some, some data solution automation. So I'm not going to go through the whole uh, workshop, but at some point we can list out any other terms that we may think are necessary or, or involved, but we're not really um, you know, we, we, we do this as, as, a, as a team exercise, as a, as a collaborative effort. Now, if we have all the concepts, we can start duplicating them. So for example, we can say, you know, a purchase is the same as a conversion, or a quote update is the same as a quote save. So we need to agree on what the, the terminology is that we're gonna go 
use that we're using going forward. And it's the same for uh, for for some other stuff. For example, online is the same as portal. And we've got Mike and policyholder and everything. We can call this an owner of cover. And at the same time, everybody else could be an additional insured. So this is where we go and figure out what the synonyms are to map and to, to declutter the board and end up with business concepts that are basically the survivors of that process. And the next, uh, the next step is to go and do the attribution. In this particular case, age is not a business concept. It's a property of, in this case, the owner of cover and the additional insured. And premium might be a property of the policy. This will now give us a cleaner model, but we still don't know which of these business concepts are related to which part of the of the event. So let's uh, let's do that. So we basically for every event we pick one. We 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 uh, well we pick it basically. For example, safe quote is uh, is one, and we're going to remove the business concepts that, that do not apply specifically for this event. So now we only have the core business concept that have a relationship to this event. In this case, saving quote, for example, but it applies to every event. The result is that for this event, only these core business concepts apply, <clears throat> and we can use that to create an initial model. It looks a bit like this, right? So the end, the end result of this this quick uh, quick workshop is that we have an initial model that looks like this. Um, also note that, for example, we can add additional relationships here. For example, plan uh, refers to policy, not necessarily to a quote. It's also used in the quote, but there's also a natural relationship here. So this is how we can can flesh that out and to get a, I guess, a common vocabulary of how we want to work with uh, the information going forward. Before we jump into the tool and start mapping the data, it's important to provide a brief overview of how Bimoflex works. So it may it, it would be a bit easier to relate what we've done so far with what we see in the tool. So at this stage, I quickly went through the modeling case. We've got the cover up insurance, we've got the, the, the transactions, we know what we want to get, we know what kind of terminology we want to work with. We've got the model. But now I guess the, the, the hard part of mapping the available data to the model needs to start, and then we can generate a solution. So Bimoflex. Bimoflex as a platform, it uses an app, a user interface to manage the design metadata. So the design of the data solution itself. So with the app, you create a business model. So the process I went through the last couple of slides, and I will show that in the tool briefly, but um, that you use the you, in, in real life, you would use the app for that. And of course, you also use it to map the data to these core business concepts. Either way, all the details are stored in the repository. So you get the data coming in, and then we get to map the sources to the business model, store all of that in the repository. This is the design side of the platform. On the delivery side, we have a different tool called a BIML Studio, and it connects to the repository where the design metadata is stored, but uses that to preview what the data solution, the resulting data solution would be. So you can have a, a logical view of your, of your data warehouse or your data lake or your hybrid or lake house or whatever you want to do. Whatever it is, that's there. And it, it shows that with the BIML script um, options. And you can use that if, let's say, if you have some really custom transformations or, or complexity that, for whatever reason, cannot be done using the patterns and the configurations and settings and overrides in the app, you can use BIML script and by extent the whole .NET framework to add whatever complexity you need in your, um, your data logistics process. So that it's it's a fully fledged um, integrated development environment, but most people they uh, they just use it to compile the metadata into whatever 
output artifacts it needs to be. So it looks like this, the delivery side, we've got BIML Studio and the BIML engine with the extension point, which is the, the custom logic. It builds or compiles into artifacts for, for data flow mappings, for ADF, for SSAS, which can then be um, deployed into some Git repository so that it integrates with uh, data solution. In this example, we're going to use ADF, Azure Data Factory, and the solution that runs, it integrates with this BIML catalog, which is the runtime repository or the control framework. And, you know, it reports things like, um, um, when did the process start? When did it finish? How many rows were loaded? Did it, did it successfully complete? It, was, there, was there a failure? What was the failure? So this telemetry control framework information, which can also be viewed through the app again. So this is where the, the arrow from the demo catalog goes back into the app. So that's the BIMOFLEX platform in a nutshell. So I'm going to exit the presentation, open the app, and use the next 20 minutes or so, 50 minutes or so, to, to really quickly go through the, the generation steps and look and see if we can find some answers. So what I've done, and I'll go and drag BIML, uh, BIML flex to the screen. As we go through the solution, we will do so pretty quickly. And as a good TV chef, I prepared a couple of intermediate steps so I can actually do move through this design uh, fast enough. And as mentioned earlier, if there's any aspects that are of interest that I sort of you know, glossed over or went through too fast, uh, please reach out and we can talk about this in a more detailed session. So um, just wanted to mention that. So these, these versions, um, they're visible in the top right of the screen. So for example, right here, this, sets, this uh, version is 10 empty configured product project. And I wanted to show sort of the, the basic setup of that enables you to do this in BIMOFLEX. And then I will switch through these versions as the solution builds up. So what are we looking at? This is the starting point. This is the dashboard. And the most important thing to start with is the connections. What I've done here is I've created a couple of connections to the different uh, sources, the, the policy master, or the, the policy management system, the quote service, and some other services. And then it's in terms of a data solution, right, the landing connection, staging, persistent staging, data fault. So these, these connections, they act as as layers or areas in your data solution design. I've created them as, as synapse uh, connections. So for example, if I pick up a data fault connection, this will map to or be generated as an Azure Data Factory synapse linked surface. And there's a lot of combinations of, of you know, technical architecture that you can, can configure like this. But for this example, I just get some data from different uh, surfaces and land it into a data lake and then map it to um, a data warehouse that is running on uh, Azure Synapse. So that, that's basically this, right? So in the project view, this is where you can use different connections to map out the flow of data effectively. And the way it is generated as a as a set of art, uh, artifacts, in this case, uh, Azure Data Factory. So I'm basically saying that the, the, the mappings that I'm finding in this source or this, this connection that I'm using as a source, I want to stage it, I want to persistent stage it, and I want to learn to data vault. That's, that's what this container of work needs to do. And it needs to be doing that in Azure Data Factory. Uh, that's pretty much it. So the other uh, big uh, big thing here is the, the business modeling. The business modeling feature is something we've released uh, with the 2022 R1 version. So it's pretty new. And it does basically what I've shown in the slides. And what you can see here is that that business modeling view. So we're, again, we're, we're mimicking this ELM or, or other approach, depending on how you want to configure this. And there's a lot of ways you can make this work for you. This is the ELM flavor that we've uh, we've prepared. But here's, this is where you go and, uh, and say, you know, Mike is actually the same and, the, and age is actually an attribute. And all the stuff that I showed earlier in the PowerPoint is, is what you do here. 
So I, I don't want to do that again. I want to go basically to the connection here and say, if I want to map some data, what do I do then? So essentially importing some data from whatever source system this is. And what we're doing here is importing the, the table structures or the file structures that we have for this particular source data, right? So the policy management system. If I load that, we will get a couple of data objects here in the tree view, and we can start mapping this to the model. So this is where I'm going to switch to a little bit further, where we have all the sources imported, but we don't have we we haven't done anything with it yet, right? We have the source data, and we have the business model. The next step to combine them together is to go to the accelerator feature. An accelerator feature in this case will use the source structures, for example, the policy master, and it will, it will generate, I'm going to enable the columns here as well, it will generate a rather technical view of, uh, a technical data, <laughs> data vault view of your source data. So if you've seen my uh, previous presentation, this would be a source-based data vault model. Not always as useful, uh, certainly not something we, we want to do for now. We want to use the starting point and then modify our mappings and our transformations and our model to morph this, this, these source data sets onto that business model. And this is where we actually make that mapping. Because if you say here this hub policy master, if we want to call this something else or we want to map it to something else, for example, a business entity policy, we do that here. And if we save that, that connection, then everything here will be renamed or, or in, inherit the, the, the holistic name or the business model name of policy. And this is where we can add other bits of information and other data sets. We can use this to split satellites and to join links together and, and all kinds of things like that, which is not really the, the point of today's, uh, today's presentation. What I wanted to show is that if we go and look at, um, where did it go? It, our quote surface. So this has been inferred because it has been, it's not really a hub on itself yet, but I can make it so because I can also link other information from the quote onto that. So what we have here is basically the quote business concept that we link to a policy. And I'm going to go a little bit further in my model to save all the, the clicking and the spitting and the joining of the links and everything that, that you know, we need to do to get this data vault model to, uh, to, be, <laughs> to be more as we want it to be. It looks like this. So again, I'm going to select the quote surface and the policy master. I'm going to enable the columns again. And here now, I've got a policy. A policy links to a plan. Policy has some descriptive information. And a policy links to a quote. And the quote has some descriptive information. That's pretty much what I want. And I'm going to, for completeness sake, add all the other tables as well. And one of the interesting things here, we've created a three-way link to say the, the, the policy belongs, has a relation to benefit and a premium component that we can say, this is the amount of premium that is related to a specific uh, benefit for this policy and stuff like that. So we're using the same data. We're, we're, we're modifying our data, um, our data fault as a, as a, as a result. And all these uh, these mappings from these core business concepts, the mapping to the um, to the business entities are are retained here. This itself is not enough to answer the questions we're looking for, because we have a, um, I need to look where it went again. We've got the policy that maps to the quote. 
but it doesn't really say it doesn't do the gluing just yet. So we can't we, we can't say that these different sessions and these different transactions they're all related to the same purchase path or the same customer journey, right? From looking at different options all the way to purchasing something. So we need to add a couple of additional transformations or interpretations on this raw data to figure out how that works. So we need to be able to to cluster these unique quotes into something um, yeah, that binds them together. So this is where the 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 the, the raw data fault, or sorry, the, the business data fault transactions come in. You may have seen here that I've created a derived connection. So this is specifically meant for the um, the business logic that needs to be layered on top of the data fault model. So if we go to the to the data fault derived version, then go back to the accelerator. Now what I basically what I've basically done is I've created an object that loads from the data fault, which can then be accelerated as well into its own data fault objects that augment the existing context for the core business concepts. So these two objects here, converted quote and cluster quote, if I select those, and I'll again enable the column, I'm basically saying from the quote business concept starting point, I'm, I can link this to a quote, uh, a quote cluster. So uh, a, um, an independent transaction in that quote surface is then clustered into um, a group, right? And that becomes more clear once I add the quote surface again, and for argument's sake, the policy master as well. So again, the policy goes to the quote, but this time the quote is then mapped to a grouping, the quote cluster. So at this stage, this business data fault component is then added to the data fault to build the whole solution. What I wanted to do now, uh, also for, for time's uh, uh, sake of time, is to go through the last step where there's also a data mart uh, prepared. Probably should go and show that this it, it's uh, it's the simplest of, of fact tables. But basically, we pick up the data vault, including this business data vault component, to bring together a fact conversion with some descriptive information. So what I want to do now is really move to the deployment side and see how this design, what it would look like if we were to compile it, generate it, deploy it, run it, and see what to see what happens. So for that, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm leaving the, the design environment and open up the delivery environment, which is the Bilmo Studio environment. If I open up that solution, the first thing I'll see is that I've got all these, um, these things here, right? In my, in my data warehouse, in my data factory, I will, I will get data sets, I will get link surfaces, I will get pipelines, I will get batches, I will get store procedures, we get all kinds of things that are generated using the design metadata. And it, it's at this stage that we, if we want to, we can look at the, the BIML script code that generates this, and we can use what we call extension points to override specific technical behavior at this level, again, if we want to. Usually don't need it, but, you know, just wanted to show that the metadata is in BIML Studio picked up, previewed in this logical view we see here, and this is what we expect to see in, um, in uh, Azure Data Factory. Now, I'm going to quickly go to my Azure Data Factory environment and see if it's there. So I've set up this data factory that acts as a yeah, location to execute this, this output, right? So there's nothing, nothing at the moment. If I build this solution, so compile the metadata against the integration template that I've set in the project, the ADF template in this case, it will, the, the BIML engine will run the compiler, generate the ADF code, and put it, um, put it someplace. Let's wait for it to finish. 
processing BIMO code is what it's doing, right? So it's going through everything. And oh, by the way, all the all the additional logic that you save as part of the solution will be compiled with the solution, of course. So that's been successful. And what we're seeing now is that if I go um, to my Git repository that is connected to the output of this uh, this build process, there's a whole bunch of new things. All the all the results, all the the artifacts that I expect to be delivered from this design metadata are being loaded up here. So I've got a whole bunch of table structures that, that which will create the data warehouse tables and the, the staging tables and the data vault tables and the business data vault and the data mart. And there will be a whole bunch of JSON files that contain the individual ADF artifacts. So that's all there. Really what I need to do is um, uh, complete uh, the studio build committed to my my git and now i'll just get rid of the the git for now now if i go back to my azure data factory at least i can see the results um, or should yeah should be able to see the results in uh, in here so this will create all the all the adf artifacts right and or whatever integration template we've uh, we've selected so the batches the processes and stuff like that so when I when I'm happy with how this looks, and again it should be the same as it is in Bim Studio, the next step really is to go and raise a pull request in my um, in my dev environment and say push to production. So get all these commits that are just uploaded, run them, complete them. This will let's not delete my dev branch. This will push the changes to production. It will kick off a pipeline. It will deploy the tables in the Synapse data warehouse. It will then start running the ADF um, the data logistics processes, the pipelines. And yeah, then I've got all the data loaded from these sources into the data vault, into the business data vault and the data mart. I know I'm going through this super quickly, right? And there's a massive, massive, massive amount of detail that is worth discussing uh, again please uh, reach out if uh, if you if you do want to do this at some point let me see if the pipeline is uh, is running ah, it's still uh, still running so let's uh, let let's leave that what we can do in the meantime is while this runs is look at the results in uh, signups i'm looking at the source data here so i've got a couple of quotes doesn't really matter but i did prepare earlier what kind of queries I need to answer these original questions. So if I want to know how many quotes lead to a conversion, which we've solved by clustering the quotes into a, a quote cluster concept using a business data fault, uh, Hoplink, Satellite, and LSAT, load that into a fact table. And then I need to switch to my signups workspace and I run it. Ah, it's all it's it's there now, so that's fine. So this um, this will tell me that the um, there's a 20 hour time that we have from quote to sale. Uh, six quotes were ultimately uh, well, a, a quote was modified six times before we ended converting, which uh, is a quote to sale ratio of 1. Uh, 0. 0.167. For the insurance people. Under us, that's uh, super interesting, right? And I, I, I do have that background a little bit. But we can, we can do this for the single customer journey that we've seen. We can do it for uh, for the others as well. The the second question is something we can't directly answer from our um, our fact table at this moment. What kind of benefits were not selected? So for the example, I've created a query here that queries the data vault directly, so not using the fact table, and just says you know, which of the benefits as per the hub benefit concept did not exist in any of the policies. Which means that we have extreme events was not selected and overnight stay was not selected. And the ones that were selected, the only difference is not exist or exist and excluding the zero record, waiting period and access. So apparently this quote that took six times to uh, to convert it, uh, it ultimately only used these two benefits. So 
I wanted to leave that whirlwind overview of how Bimoflex works and how we can use it to create a business model, how to map the business model to data sources to create, in this case, a data fault model, and then deploy and run it to, um, to be able to analyze some of these, uh, these data outcomes. Um, and it's been a whirlwind overview. Um, I think it's, you know, I, I hope it's, 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 it's sparked your interest in seeing a bit more. Uh, in any case, I wanted to thank you for your time because it really is always a pleasure to to show and discuss topics such as these with you, my my peers, right? So my contact details are obviously on the slide deck here, and and please reach out if you want to do want to know more. Summarizing, we've looked at how we can apply business modeling to uh, to this insurance case study and use the model to map the available data. We were able to use that to generate a data fault solution, deploy it, run it, and look at the, the outcomes. And from this point onwards, we can modify the solution further and add more data sources and tweak the data fault and all those kinds of things, keeping the business model in mind. We can now map new data to these generic business concepts and keep forward engineering the solution uh, as we've done using BIML Studio. So it's a separation of the modeling and the design from the delivery. And if you want to switch to different patterns, such as, you know, mapping data flows or procedures, or we're working on all kinds of Sparkle and, and, and Databricks solutions. So that's, that's just a change of this integration template that you specify at project level. So if you want to know more, please reach out. And then we can, you know, look, spend some time to see what Bimoflex can, can do for you and demo something and discuss how the tool can meet your requirements. Thanks for listening, and I'm doing very well for time. This is exactly what I've planned for, so we've got a bit of time for questions if there is any. Um, Roland, in the in the business, business modeling part, can can you show that again, please? Um, yeah, sure. Absolutely. So here's the the outcome of the last one. Yeah. So these are all business objects. Can you can you add can can you add uh, some some business content? So um, a business description of a, um, of one of these objects in there, or do you just have the name? Is that we 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 have a bit oh, of you have these definitions here. Yeah. Okay. That's yeah. Fine. Definitions, subject areas. We can use classifications. Uh, uh, and tags and stuff like that. If you want to make something, I don't know, you know, GDPR related or or put it into some sort of other uh, grouping of source, you can uh, you can do that. So um, there's there's you can also and, and business course, subject uh, is, is is something like the business area, I like a subject area. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So, so or you, but it's whatever you want it to be, really. But it's meant to, meant to be. Um, um, like HR or finance or you know like like a business area as you said yeah. Uh, and on the on the on the PowerPoint it looked like you you can you can move new two over new one is that is that right did I get that right yeah. or is that yeah so if you want to say new two is the same as new one then we just merge them together as our attribute oh that's that's great that's really great. It's just, the, the, I guess the the tool version of making the two post its uh, you know putting yeah, them on the yeah. same the same spot. <laughs> oh, if there's no other questions, um, then again I want to thank you for uh, for your time and I hope it was interesting and yeah I hope um, I hope to hear from you again. Uh, stay tuned for the next ones, which will be around uh, Lake House and mapping data flows and data bricks and stuff like that. It will be in a week or two. So uh, watch this space. <laughs>